All right, I admit it. I get a little excited when Parts Express introduces new speaker drivers, especially smaller ones with a bunch of excursion. PE dropped these two little bombs on us last year, the Epic 5.5 inch and 7 inch extended range subwoofers. And I've really been enjoying the smaller driver matched with a couple of larger passive radiators. But of course I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have matching passive radiators for this driver? Well, Parts Express was thinking the same thing and recently started shipping matching passive radiators for both the 5.5 inch and 7 inch Epic drivers. Today's project is a small active subwoofer that I named the Epic 777. And it uses three Dayton products. One Epic 7 inch extended range subwoofer with two matching passive radiators along with the Dayton Audio SPA 300D 300 watt subwoofer Palladium. I'm Thomas, this is Zarbo Audio Projects, and I'm glad you're here because I can't wait to show you how I built this awesome subwoofer. Let's get started. After some fiddling around in WinISD and knowing that I wanted to keep the cabinet size as small as practical, I decided on a roughly 12 liter enclosure, which when using 3 quarter inch material means about an 11 inch cube. This would be closer to 14 liters in reality, but as you can see, I designed a shallow sub-enclosure for the plate amp. I didn't add any weight to the passive radiators, and I did my simulations with both 4 ohm coils wired in series for an 8 ohm load. As you can see from the graphs, the predicted response is for an F3 of 41 hertz, an F6 of 37 hertz, and an F10 of 33 hertz. Not super deep, but for music, this should be a pretty good setup. The passives do come with weight discs that you can add, but while adding weight did make the lower frequencies louder, it did so at the expense of the upper bass frequencies, and you're already dealing with excursion issues below 30 hertz or so, so I thought it was kind of pointless to tune any lower with added weight on those passive radiators. As usual, I did a little sketch of the box before I started cutting any wood. Besides telling me how many of what size boards I need to cut, doing this also tells me where each board goes as I'm gluing it together. You know, it might be hard to believe, but you can actually put glue on the wrong part of a board during assembly. Then you kind of feel like an idiot. So I found that it's better just to make a sketch and follow that. You know, I like cubes. They're so easy to build. You only need to change the saw fence three times. I was considering using half inch material for this enclosure, but as I sketched it up, I realized that I wanted to put a really large round over on four corners. So I went with three quarter inch MDF instead. What's your opinion on the way I did the roundovers? Two vertical and two horizontal. Let me know in the comments below what you think about that. I cut the 11 inch boards first, then the 11 by 9 and a half inch boards, and then finally the 9 and a half inch square boards last. Before I assemble the enclosure, I need to make the sub enclosure for the plate amp. And for that, I'm using 1 quarter inch HDF for the sides and 1 half inch MDF for the back. And I just taped this together until it cured. After cutting the opening for the amp with a jigsaw and gluing the inner sub-enclosure to the back panel, I can now glue the entire enclosure up. For that, I use Gorilla Glue and clamps. Gorilla Glue isn't really any stronger than tight bond wood glue, but it does expand and foam out, which effectively seals the cabinet airtight, so that's why I'm using it here. Man, I sure am glad I've got a lot of clamps. After that cures, it's off to the horizontal belt sander to get things cleaned up. And then I can tackle the roundover. I'm trying to go for a particular look here. It only really works with large roundovers though. And the biggest bit I have for a roundover is one and a quarter inches. That's yeah, big, but I think any smaller and it would probably look less like alternating curves like I want it to look and more like I just got mixed up when I was doing the roundovers on my router table. I think this will work though. I will know for sure when I get some veneer on it. Fingers crossed. After a bit of sanding to finish smoothing out those curves, it's off to pick out some veneer for this project. I'm going with a man-made veneer that has some interesting folded grain patterns in it. I really like it a lot and it wasn't even super expensive. I'll leave a link in the description below if you're interested. I have to join two pieces of veneer together as the sheets that I got were not wide enough to wrap around the front and both sides. I am able to do the top and back in one piece because the bottom doesn't need to be veneered. I'll just put a bit of black paint on that since it won't be seen. All 
I'm using my preferred iron-on method to adhere the veneer, and I gave each of the two applications a good 10 hours or so to dry before trimming, since it may shrink ever so slightly if you trim it too soon after ironing it on. You know, I used to use a trim router to remove the excess veneer and then sand the remaining little bit with a sanding block, but this veneer is so thin that I just ended up trimming it with a razor or X-Acto blade and then block sanding flush. Super easy. And now I have to create the driver recesses and cutouts. And I have to admit that this is my least favorite part of speaker building. I just find this to be drudgery. But after a few hours of work, I was done and happy with the results. I'm not even sure why I hate doing driver recesses so much. Probably for the same reason I don't like the taste of avocado. I just don't like it. But these drivers have a one quarter inch thick flange and they look much better recessed, so that's what I did. The sub-enclosure I already made for the plate amp isn't deep enough to hold the amp internals, as I mentioned. I plan to make an outer amp enclosure extension to create the needed space for the amp guts. I was debating how to do that, but ended up doing a simple piece of three quarter inch MDF, which I cut to eight and a quarter inch tall by seven and a quarter inch wide. I rounded the corners similar to the corners on the amp with some sandpaper, and then I used a portion of a one half inch roundover bit to ease the sides ever so slightly. All this is overkill, I know. This amp could just have been mounted directly inside the enclosure. It's airtight and pretty sturdy looking, but I just don't like the idea of massive vibrations trying to find the weakest link in my subwoofer plate amp. Vibration and large temperature swings are the enemy of electronics. And this is a fairly easy way of making sure that the amp has the best chance of making it through its five-year warranty period. This outer amp enclosure extension was sanded, primered with bin shellac based primer, and then painted with a rust-oleum stone texture paint, which I then clear coated to protect the texture. Easy enough. I marked the holes for the drivers and drilled down an appropriate hole for the number six black oxide screws that I will use to mount these with. They actually ran a screw in and out of each of the screw holes and then dropped in several drops of super glue, which hardens that area up a bit so the screw won't strip out as easily if I get a little too aggressive with the screwdriver. Not that that's ever happened. Now I'm ready to give the cabinet a final sanding with 220 grit before I dust it off and apply some finish. I'm going with polyurethane for the finish, and this is where I think I may have made a mistake. Not that there's anything wrong with poly, but this thing darkened up so much that when I applied the poly, it's hard to see the unique grain lines that the veneer has. Check out this before and after shot of the cabinet and you'll see what I mean. More on that later, but continuing on, I laid down the first coat of poly with spray cans out in the garage, and then I brought it downstairs to my basement to apply several successive coats of Minwax rub-on poly. And then by chance, I happened to find a can of General Finish's Armor Seal poly, which can also be rubbed on with a cloth. So I went with a coat of that as it builds thickness a lot faster than the Minwax. Once the cabinet looked nice and shiny and even, I stopped and I gave that a day or so to cure. There are a few little details that need to be done before assembly. I need to apply black paint to the driver recess area so that you don't see any light colored MDF in the crack, and I also need to paint the bottom of the enclosure since I didn't veneer it. Now this is just cheap matte black latex paint in case you're wondering. Now I have to drill a hole in the amp sub enclosure to get the speaker lead to the driver. I cut a lead to go from the plate amp to the driver and I pass that through the panel. Then I mix up some 5 minute epoxy, put a little tape on there to keep the epoxy from all running down out of the hole, and then I just glopped it all in there. It's a little hard to see in here, but trust me, that's what I did. I did this to ensure an airtight seal between the main enclosure and the amp sub enclosure. After the epoxy cured, I soldered the remaining speaker leads from the amp to the wire, and I also had to create a short lead with two quick disconnect terminals on it to wire the dual 4 ohm coils in series for an 8 ohm load total to the amp. And then I covered the leads with some flat poly material, adhered with spray adhesive to prevent any vibrations of the wire against the enclosure, the driver, or passive radiator frames. Now I can get it all put together. I placed the outer amp trim ring on the cabinet, and then with some of those nice cap head screws from Parts Express, I went through the 3 quarter inch trim ring right into the cabinet. The trim ring isn't really even mounted to the cabinet, it's almost acting like a gasket just held in place via the screws. Next, I hook up and mount the driver with number six black oxide screws from Parts Express. They're one inch long. Then I did the same for the passive radiators as well. I did shove like a basketball amount of polyfill in there just to quiet any reflections and such. I even tried to arrange the cones so that the pattern of the carbon fiber is the same for each of the driver units. It's a small thing, especially since they're not all on the same panel, and you probably won't even notice, but Little details like this, I think, are worth doing once you know about them. 
One last step is to apply the bottom feet. I didn't want to do anything fancy for this. I just wanted it slightly lifted off the floor. And these are adhesive backed felt feet. And I think I actually bought these from the dollar store a while back. They're like an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, something like that. I painted them with some of the flat black paint that I painted the bottom of the enclosure with just in case you happen to see them under the cabinet. You wouldn't see a light tan thing, but it would be black and you wouldn't really actually end up seeing it at all. And that's about it. This cabinet is done. The first step is to check for air tightness. I do this by pressing on both of the passive radiators, watching the center driver push out. And I wait to see if it pulls back in on its own. This is in real time, and as you can see, the cone stays out and we have a good airtight seal. Nice. Now it's time to put some signal to it and shake it out a bit. For this, I'm using my trusty Marlin P. Jones signal generator kit. Now let's run a sweep to see what the frequency response of the finished product is and compare it with the predicted response in WinISD. How about we listen to some YouTube music with this sub paired with my tiny Bantam speaker system. To say I'm pretty happy with it. The 7 inch Epic subwoofer has a bit more output than the 5.5 inch unit. Also, I really like the look of the matching passive drive units with this driver. They really add a bit of class to the design. As of the making of this video, the 7 inch passives were only around $40 each, so that's fairly reasonable for how nice they are. To my ear, this subwoofer plays plenty deep enough for music, and it's loud, even for this room, which is fairly big. And I think it looks pretty cool if I do say so myself. If you would like to build this subwoofer, check out the links below for a link to the Parts Express Tech Talk forum where I posted all the details you'll need to build one of these fantastic powered subwoofers for yourself. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. After a bit of sanding to finish smoothing out the curves, it's off to. P it's crap, man can't even read. It's right there. I can't even read. It's just reading. I don't even have to think. I just have to read. Apparently it's not that easy for me.